um, to our May program. So this is the Champaign County Audubon Society's May program. And my name is Alida de Flamen, and I am the program chair for CCAS. And so uh, we're celebrating Pride a little early this year, and this is because uh, CCAS usually don't have online events uh, during the summer. Um, so we're very glad that you're all here and very excited for this uh, talk. Uh, it's, it promises to be a very informative talk. Um, so before we get started, I just want to go through some housekeeping rules. Um, so this talk will be recorded and we'll post it on YouTube afterwards. And you can find, I'll also post the link to our YouTube channel in the, in the chat box uh, when we get started. Um, but you'll, you'll also be able to find it on our website, a link to our YouTube chan channel on our website. And I'll post the website link in the chat as well, but it's pretty easy to find. You just Google search uh, Champaign County Audubon Society and we come up. So I also wanted to ask that you all please keep yourself muted. Um, there will be a session at the end, which is a question session. And for that, you can unmute yourself. But if you at any point have any other questions that you'd like to post in the chat box, um, I will also keep track of those. And um, Nathan and I can go through those at the end uh, during the question session. Um, so uh, some general announcements. Um, the spring birdathon, or yeah, the spring birdathon and the spring bird count is actually happening or starting this weekend. Um, and if you're interested uh, to find out more information on that, you can join our Facebook group or also check out our website. Um, and I'll also post the link to the Facebook group in the chat once we get started. Um, if you're interested in joining CCIS, um, uh, monthly or yearly fees are uh, a pretty affordable, fifteen dollars, um, and you can find information about that as well on the website, which I'll share. Um, but with that, I'm going to end the announcements and introduce you to our speaker tonight. So it's my privilege to introduce you to Nathan Alexander, who's uh, going to lead tonight's talk. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet and get to know Nathan during grad school year at U of I. Um, and I have to say, um, I admire Nathan so much, both as a friend and as a colleague, uh, because he is such a dynamic person. Um, I won't go into too much detail because I wanna uh, dedicate most of uh, the next hour or so uh, to Nathan. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nathan. Um, you're welcome to take it away. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to um, create this talk pretty much in response to a lot of the uh, kind of uh, biological determinism that um, we've seen recently. Uh, I first started seeing a lot of it come out with uh, the appointment of Dr. Levine and it's kind of continued on. Um, I also want to highlight that this is a group effort. I couldn't have done this alone. And so this presentation is really kind of an effort to show how sex determination moves past just chromosomes and provide kind of a more broad understanding of what we mean when we're discussing sex in terms of biology and ecology. So I kind of really want to set up what this is and what it's not. Um, the authors of this talk are wildlife ecologists, we're geneticists, and then uh, there's also social scientists who contributed to this. Um, this is just an introduction and this is not finite. Uh, let me just tell you that when I started looking at all of this, um, I thought it would be a short presentation and then I, I've spent multiple months trying to go through the literature and curate all of this and it's incredibly expansive. So this is just kind of a brief introduction to a lot of different uh, systems. Um, we also wanna make sure that this talk is not going to have people leaving here thinking that this is a certain way that trans people should be identified or intersex people should be identified. Um, this is not a presentation on transgender identities. This is focusing on how sex is non-binary in a lot of our ecological senses. And it's an effort to kind of 
expose more people to those understandings. So we're going to have a fairly uh, kind of three parts to this talk. We're, we're going to talk about definitions of sex and humans, or sex and gender and humans. We're going to talk about sex assignment and wildlife. And then we're going to talk about some of these non-binary reproductive systems we also see in wildlife. So first off, in humans. Oh, I went too far. Um, so this is a diagram created by trans students on kind of covering the different ideas of gender identity, gender expression, sex assignment, physical attraction, and, emotionally, and emotional attraction. And what we see is that they've really highlighted that most of these are on continuums where your gender identity could be, uh, you know, woman, man, or other. And then you can fall anywhere along this spectrum in your gender identity. And this holds true for gender expression, uh, sexual attraction, emotional attraction. And you, know, you can be anywhere on this where you don't identify as a gender or you're not attracted to anyone. And then you could be on the far right where you're attracted to a single person or a single uh, physical attribute or something like that. Um, Sex assigned at birth is the typical uh, term we use for uh, the classification of people when they are born. And generally they are assigned as male, female, or intersex based off of anatomy, hormones, or chromosomes. And that's kind of what the doctor says a baby is. However, when we look at these categories, uh, one of the questions I always have is, why is this the only one that's categorical? Why is this the only one that's not viewed as a continuum or viewed in another manner? And so this is hoping to expand that into more of this uh, nebulous and uh, continual definition. And to get at this, we have to understand what biological determinism is. It's a phrase that's used to kind of denote males and females based on uh, chromosomes, hormones, sex organs, or physical characteristics. And we really wanted to highlight that it's harmful when it's applied to humans because it tends to oversimplify sex. Um, especially in humans, sex tends to be a social construct as well, where it really ties the gender to the body. So even for transgender individuals, that identity is rooted in the sex that they were assigned at birth. And we're working on how do we uh, decouple that and how do we have a more inclusive society? And this, con this binary of male and female is something that's not particularly seen in humans either. Uh, we start with what is known as a bipotential gonad where it could either uh, become a penis or it could become a vagina and clitoris. Um, and this is often assigned to sex chromosomes where there are uh, XX generally assigned female or XY generally assigned male. However, there are intersex conditions where some individuals will have one sex chromosome and some individual will have three or more sex chromosomes. And people with these chromosome formations are identified as intersex individuals, where there is a combination of chromosomes, gonads, hormones, or uh, a physical appearance of genitals that differ from the standard male or female. And this is not particularly rare. Um, there's at least 25 conditions of intersex uh, uh, conditions known and there's an estimated around 120 million intersex people globally. And so this is a fairly large number. Um, it's not a rare instance. And just to give you an idea, here's kind of a brief uh, overview of a few categories of um, intersex conditions in humans, where for like the progestin-induced and androgenization, the chromosomes will be an XX chromosome. Um, and then it's due to androgen ex overexposure in utero. And they may have ovaries and a uterus, but they may lack a cervix. 
and then the uh, clitoris may be enlarged or a uh, more developed penis without testes. And there's different uh, conditions which will result in different um, uh, phenotypes or physical portrayals that won't necessarily match what the chromosomes are. And this might happen midway through life. So an individual may not know that they are intersex until puberty or around that time. And kind of one of the main reasons why we're talking about intersex is that sex has been heavily medicalized in our society. So there has been surgical interventions to align intersex bodies to kind of this ideal binary type where they're either male or female and that has perpetuated harm to intersex individuals. Uh, doctors have historically recommended these surg surgeries to parents as necessary when often they're not. Um, it's often based off of cosmetic uh, desires. And these surgeries can cause kind of um, ramifications later on in an individual's life where sex won't be pleasurable and gender socialization may be difficult due to kind of this assumption of binary uh, expectations. So more about that though, is this concept of chromosomes where how are people defined by sex is heavily dependent on chromosomes, but the Y chromosome was discovered in 1905. And since that time, people have been kind of narrowing in on really trying to figure out what is it that makes sex sex in humans. And so in 1966, they identified that this top region of the Y chromosome is what really controls what makes somebody uh, male. And then in 1966, they further expanded this. And in 1967, they found this ZFY region. And then in 1989, they even zeroed in further until in 1990, they linked it to a single gene. And a gene is a specific site on a chromosome. And this gene that they found was the SRY gene, which is on the Y chromosome. However, this doesn't hold true across taxa. There's multiple species that will have multiple sex determining genes. There's what are known as master switches um, and other species that are not this SRY gene. And there's not a single gene that will determine sex across species. So we've kind of just found the SRY gene in the 1990s, and we still don't fully understand how it um, fully functions. So what people have found is that the SRY activates the SOX9 group. And I know this is kind of like a, a technical genetic talk for a bit, but hang in and we'll, we'll get to some fun stuff. Um, but what does this activation actually look like? Well, when for the SOX9, it triggers th all of these other genes to become activated. And so there is large interactions across all of these different genes, all of which have the possibility for uh, misfires or something to happen to prevent connections. And so it's a heavily complex system that is kind of triggered by this one gene. And so why isn't SRY everything? You know, it's this one gene where we can identify male or not, but it's not just that because there are other conditions where somebody might have an SRY gene but not an X or, but not a Y uh, chromosome. And there can be different ways that these uh, genes interact within the body. And, you know, intersex children undergo surgeries as infants. Intersex healthcare is often behind that of even LGB healthcare. So lesbian, gay, or bisexual healthcare. Uh, genetic methods of sexing don't always account for these nuances. Um, and just because these category, categories aren't discussed historically, it doesn't mean they're not important. And it's really important to kind of increase representation for erased identities, especially in science and medical health. And finally, uh, people really weaponize this kind of biological argument um, 
without fully understanding all of the nuances behind it. And yeah. So I, I know that was kind of a lot for a little bit. I kind of wanted to pause for questions. I do want to acknowledge that we're being recorded. So if you want to ask your questions off recording, uh, there will be time at the end. But are there any questions currently? So for part two, we're going to get into sex assignment and wildlife. I kind of wanted to just set up the human discussion. And now we're going to kind of move into a broad array of different ways that sex is assigned in wildlife. So there's physical structures, there's chromosomes, the, uh, there's wildlife species that undergo sex changes. There's uh, wildlife that are uh, sex dependent on um, temperature where temperature influences their sex identity. Um, and then there's hormones, which also impact sex. Outside of this, there's also non-binary reproductive systems where there's parthenogenesis, where some species are a single sex, or um, they uh, interact with uh, members of the same species or other species in such a, an interesting way where they don't necessarily need um, a male counterpart for uh, procreation. So sex assignment and wildlife. And these are all of the species that I've seen while working out in the field. Um, and so what is wildlife? Uh, you all are uh, Audubon Society. You all probably know this. But uh, wildlife is just going to be used here quickly as the living things and especially mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians and fishes that are not human and they're not domesticated. So, um, you know, it, it's all of the squirrels on campus, even though some would argue that they are domesticated at this point. Um, and throughout wildlife, it's heavily diverse where the evolution of sex chromosomes is not irreversible or one direction various chromosomal sex determination exists in species where different chromosomes trigger sex differentiation. Um, species will undergo sex change midlife. Uh, it can be driven by temperature, hormones, single sex species, kind of covered this a little bit. But, but first we wanna start with why do we determine uh, sex in wildlife? And this is mostly so that we can understand what is happening in wildlife. And one of my favorite uh, sayings is that um, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So what often happens is that we're trying to create these models so we can understand how wildlife persists on the landscape or these different interactions wildlife has. So we use sex to understand population structure and social interactions or we use sex to design conservation or anti-poaching strategies. And there's all of these different ways that we apply sex, but that does not necessarily mean that our sex identification is foolproof. It, it's um, a, a means to try to create models. And within that, we ultimately probably miss sex certain individuals. And in extinct species in particular, uh, it's, we rely on genetics a lot to understand the population dynamics, as well as um, the locations and the ecologies of those species. And then we're also kind of constrained by sampling bias, where only certain individuals were uh, preserved back in the day. So you might have museum collections where only uh, male birds were, were um, preserved, so those are the only genetic markers we have. Um, however, there are intersex individuals in wildlife as well. In uh, 2019, Einfeld published this uh, paper where they did physiological examinations on whales, and they found that two whales that they would have identified as female when they genotyped um, or actually they had an XY chromosome. And so 
it's important to understand that these intersex conditions exist in the natural world. And just because they're not necessarily present in studies 100% of the time, it's most likely due to how we are assigning sex ourselves as biologists. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the species I specifically work with. So I work with small mammals um, heavily, and then I've done some work with the songbirds as well. And so these ways that we determine sex is highly variable. So in small mammals, we tend to assign male or female, but then we go further beyond that and we assign kind of reproductive status based off of uh, certain characteristics that are um, exhibited by the individual. So females uh, might have hair loss around the nipple or uh, they might be scrotal where the testes are descended. In songbirds, we can use plumage or uh, cloacal protuberance where that's kind of the size of the cloaca. Um, and these are some figures or some images I've taken of different small mammals. And so on the right, you can see a flying squirrel that would be considered scrotal because the testes are descended and uh, you would actually palpate the testes a little bit to determine size and um, reproductive status. In the middle, we have a flying squirrel nipple where you can see hair loss and some enlargement, um, which indicates milk production and uh, nursing by young. And so these are just kind of the external cues that we use as biologists to determine sex of a species. In birds, you kind of rely heavily on uh, coloration, co uh, song, or uh, the cloacal protuberance to determine um, uh, reproductive status. So males in particular will have an engorged cloacal protuberance when they are in breeding season. However, along with that in birds, there are things called genandromorphs. And this isn't just in birds, uh, it's across other taxa as well. And they're still trying to understand what causes all of this. And what they found was that um, this is actually cell specific. So there are certain cells within a genandromorph that will uh, be coded as a ZW, which is a female bird, and then ZZ, which is a male bird. And one of the ways, one of the interesting things that this has led to is that um, it shows that hormones aren't the things driving uh, sec secondary sex determination in birds. So things that are, because hormone levels would be consistent throughout the entire bird, it's how the cells are interacting with that hormone, which is causing um, kind of this bilateral uh, representation of both male and female characteristics. Um, and in the figure, we kind of see uh, a female chicken on the left and a male chicken on the right, and it's a genandromorph. So when we're talking about chromosomes, there's kind of two extremes of uh, chromosomes where there's homomorphic, which means they look exactly alike, so on the left, we see the XZ and the YW chromosomes are similar in length um, and representation. However, on the right, we have heteromorphic chromosomes, meaning that they look different. And so the YW is much shorter and smaller than the XZ chromosome. And across taxa, uh, individuals can kind of fall anywhere along the spectrum and it's a continuum. So uh, just know that the chromosome size difference varies between species as well. Uh, we're going to be discussing ploidy, which is kind of the sets of chromosomes. So like diploidy would be two sets of chromosomes, so like an XX or an XY, where a triploidy would be like XXY. Um, we're going to be discussing hermaphroditism, which is used in wildlife ecology, but not in humans. Um, and so some animals either have both reproductive organs at once, or it will change over time. Environmental sex determination uh, is when sex determination is due to external factors like temperature and not due to genetic factors. And then we have genetic sex determination where sex determination is due to genetic factors like uh, DNA, hormones, and all of that. To give you kind of an idea of uh, sex determination across taxa, um, a lot of people have kind of looked into this and we see that there's certain 
uh, groups where there's a lot of variety in how sex is determined. So in mammalia, we tend to kind of view it as very X, Y, X, O. Um, however, as soon as we start getting into the reptiles, we see that there are homomorphic sex chromosomes, which means that they look similar. Uh, we see that they have the ZW um, chromosomes like birds do. Uh, we see that they are uh, influenced by environmental conditions. And so there's a wide range of factors that are playing across taxa into sex determination. So, uh, yeah, here's some pictures of uh, waterfowl that, that our co-author Jamie took just to kind of represent the female morph, which it would be ZW, and the male morph, which would be ZZ. It's also important to note that the number of chromosomes that determine sex varies between species. So in mammals, we tend to think of it as there's two sex chromosomes that will determine sex. In birds, there's two sex chromosomes that determine sex. In platypuses, there's 10. And so whenever we're talking about chromosomes within a species, it's important for us to note which species we're looking at and we adjust how we define sex dependent upon that. Um, and chromosome in, chromosomes in wildlife are incredibly complex. There's kind of this idea called the evolutionary trap hypothesis where once a sex uh, determining gene evolves, it won't change back. However, recent studies have kind of shown that that's not really the case. And this has mostly been done through simulation work. Um, but sex chromosomes can also evolve very quickly and they can change very quickly. Some chromosomes are undifferentiated over most of the length where you, know, you might have two chromosomes that look almost identical, but there's just one little gene that will kind of cause a large effect in phenotype or uh, physical representation. And also it's important to note that our study of this is biased because a lot of the time we're interested in things that are different. So if things look similar, there's going to be less research done on them because it's less interesting to us. It's, it's more about, oh, why are these things different rather than why are these things the same? And so a lot of our understanding of chromosomes comes from species and uh, taxa that have large variance between individuals. So how does a sex chromosome kind of arise over generations? You might, have, you might start off with an autosome where there's no sex determining gene, and then all of a sudden it mutates into a sex determining gene. And through this, uh, the only way that uh, new genes really arise is through mutations. And so all of a sudden you have this new gene where it will determine whether or not an individual uh, how an individual sex is expressed. And while that happens, the neighboring areas of the gene might become associated with it because as uh, chromosomes swap parts of um, genetic material during sexual reproduction, kind of the neighboring areas tend to kind of go along for the ride where you get sections swapping over rather than just random genes at the specific location. And so now we have some other characteristics that might be uh, sex specific genes rather than sex determining genes. So this might be uh, causing secondary sexual characteristics like uh, bird plumage. And then it kind of enters the system where you may join, you may gain new sex determining genes, you may gain uh, new uh, sex specific genes, and then the other genes on that chromosome may start to kind of uh, erode away or degenerate where the chromosome will shorten in length until it's just kind of containing that little bit of information. And so through this kind of process, we get these kind of like uh, heteromorphic chromosomes as well as uh, these certain genes and certain related uh, genes that code for sex or sex characteristics as we define them. So 
chromosomes are kind of one part of the story. Uh, one great um, example of kind of the awesome reproductive strategies in nature is the hermaphroditism we see in uh, predominantly coral reef fish. And what they tend to undergo is called sequential hermaphroditism, where uh, an animal will change its sex over its lifetime. And this actually allows for um, adaptation where there's increased survival and then there's increased reproduction as well. And this can happen where an individual will change from male to female, which is called protandry. And this can be induced through uh, size. So if an individual um, becomes a certain, like grows to be a certain size and is a larger individual, they may change from uh, male to female. And then there's also systems where they may change from female to male, which is called protogeny. And this can be induced through social structure or other factors. Um, one of my favorite thoughts with this is, oh, not there yet, but um, just to kind of cover around what the hermaphroditism in fish can look like is these are two uh, hermaphroditic fish species, the red porgy and the common pandora. And these are just all of the genes that are associated with uh, these different um, sexes and this process. So there's a high number of genes that are kind of coding for some of this. And all of these genes means that there are possibility for kind of interactions and um, different combinations. Um, and especially with these fish species, we see that there's actually, it tends to be a higher rate of uh, non-hermaphroditic fish becoming uh, hermaphroditic because of um, just genetics. And so this is kind of a really interesting system. And my favorite uh, thought process with this is kind of finding Nemo, where in clownfish, uh, they normally live in pairs where there's a male, there's a female, and there's juveniles. And the social hierarchy is dependent on size with the female being the largest and kind of the, the top matriarch of the system. But when the female clownfish dies, the dominant male will change sex and become the matriarch and the female. And then one of the immature fish will become a uh, male. And so uh, in this Finding Nemo's uh, father, Marlin, would have uh, transitioned into being a female that produced eggs and all of that. We're going to cover a little bit of environmental sex determination as well as other ways of uh, genetic sex determination. So like hormones. Um, there are certain species where external factors can influence the sex of uh, the individual. So temperature is a large one specifically in reptiles where um, uh, higher temperatures might cause a specific sex of a species to be male or female. Um, and this isn't necessarily a drawback. It can be beneficial for uh, populations to be able to respond to different environmental cues, um, but it does have some conservation issues as well. So especially with these uh, temperature related sex determining factors, we can see that there are some conservation problems associated with global warming. So with higher temperatures, sea turtles tend to shift towards uh, being more female skewed. So a population, not an individual, but a population will start having more female sea turtles due to higher temperatures. And so this can kind of cause an impact on how that population can persist if um, there's kind of this sex skew happening. And um, this whole global climate change may start skewing some of these reptiles. Uh, and then the ways that even reptiles respond to uh, this environmental sex determination varies between species. So as we saw kind of the, the one-sided where higher temperatures results in 
female sea turtles, crocodilians have a different uh, kind of issue where uh, female crocodiles will uh, develop at low temperatures as well as high temperatures. And so males will only uh, develop at these kind of mid temperatures. Um, along with this, I think it's important to note that there's general uh, decreases in nest success with increasing temperatures as well. Um, hormones, researching the hormone section, I'm, I'm going to be honest, was really kind of uh, disturbing. <laughs> um, so hormones kind of are thought to drive the phenotypic expression in males, where uh, this is from studies from 1948, where uh, Jost removed testes from fetal rabbits and allowed them to develop and um, found that the, the castrated fetal rabbits developed female, female phenotypes. God, I can't say that three times fast. Um, and so uh, Joss kind of proposed that this idea was that testes were needed for male development. However, further study is kind of that the shows that it's about hormones. And so these gonads secrete hormones and testosterone can uh, start to develop uh, structures like the vas deferens or different ducts that are associated with a male physiology. And then um, there's also the anti-malarian hormone, which starts to prevent ovarian ducts from forming. Um, and while this was kind of found in placental mammals, uh, in other mammals like marsupials, estrogen can actually cause uh, gonadal shifts. So if a marsupial uh, young is exposed to estrogen uh, and had already started developing testes, those can revert back into ovaries. Um, the way that people started studying hormones and sex uh, is, is very, as I said, disturbing. So in the late 1800s, um, one of the scientists who was first starting to like, well, not one of the first, but one of the scientists that was studying this uh, actually would inject himself with uh, guinea pig and dog semen as well as guinea pig and dog testicular blood in order to see if it would have an effect. And I think that it's just important to note kind of the, the oddity with which people went around trying to understand some of these systems. Um, and he did note that he felt more uh, invigorated, but later science shows that that was a placebo effect because um, your, your blood is not going to absorb semen, um, which is a sentence I never thought that I would say. However, these hormonal cues can also be tied to the environment as well. So there can be an external cue which will trigger a, a reaction in the hypothalamus or the pituitary where the brain will release chromos or will, bleh, will release hormones and then those hormones will call, cause cell differentiation. So in this study, um, we have two males that are in a shared tank and shared water. And then the smaller male would change to female. Uh, and in the other system, we have two females in the same tank where the uh, female would change to male if it was larger. In the next set of trials, what they did was they put in a piece of glass. So there was no communication between the fish except for visual. So there was no uh, hormones being secreted in the water. Um, they each had their own water system. And we saw the same effect. So the smaller male fish still became female just based off of this visual cue of a larger male being in the same vicinity. And then the larger female changed to male well, uh, the smaller female was in the same vicinity, although nothing else was shared. And then they finally just looked at what happens if you have an individual alone in a tank. And so they found that um, the male fish remained male. However, the female fish 
would transition to male if it was alone in a tank long enough. And so we really see this kind of interaction of like so social structure and environmental cues, such as like seeing another fish or temperature um, that can influence hormone development within uh, different species and cause these different, um, these different reactions. And so that was kind of a very brief overview of some of the kind of, um, kind of the part two of uh, sex determination. And I just kind of wanted to pause because I know that's kind of a lot and I probably sped through it some, but are there any questions right now that people would not mind being recorded? Well, okay, if not, I'll move on to the non-binary reproductive systems. And so here we're gonna kind of talk about parthenogenesis, and then we're gonna talk about some behaviors as well. So what do we mean by non-binary reproductive systems? We mean that these systems are kind of the not typical uh, sexual reproduction where there are two individuals of um, opposite sex. And one of the uh, most uh, kind of pertinent one of these is kind of asexual reproduction. And this is uh, through parthenogenesis, where there can be a reproduction from an egg without fertilization. So this happens in plants, invertebrates, verb and vertebrates. There's generally an absence of males associated with it whether it's because there are not males of uh, there are not males of the species at all, or because males are not present. Um, but this is not uncommon. There's more than 80 species uh, that are parthenogenic, including fish, reptiles, and amphibians. And there's different ways that this can happen. So there can be kind of these uh, what are called accidental. Oh, parthenogenesis events, where normally the species will reproduce sexually. However, occasionally there may be a, um, an offspring without sexual reproduction. Uh, there can be facultative, where females may reproduce sexually or through parthenogenesis, and it's kind of, you know, an even mixture. And then there's the obligate, where females only reproduce through parthenogenesis. So in some of these, uh, there are female only species. And one of these is a really interesting group of salamanders <laughs> called uh, ambistoma. And so ambistoma salamanders reproduce asexually, but uh, they don't comply with anything we understand about evolutionary uh, theory. They're polyploid, so that means that they have multiple sets of chromosomes, but their number of chromosomes can range from two to five. So they may have only two chromosomes or they could have up to five rather than um, other species. So there's a lot of flexibility in how they uh, reproduce. Um, the offspring can be clones of the mother or uh, they can do this process called kleptogenesis, which is uh, where there will be a mating event um, with a related species, but a, not of the same species. And the female will take parts of that genetic makeup from the male of the closely related species and incorporate that into the um, offspring. And they can take multiple uh, genetic factors from different individuals. Um, and so, you know, this was kind of a summary uh, written in 2019, but there's still very little understood about how these salamanders mate. Um, and it's a very interesting system. And then there's also behavior where, uh, this is just an example, but, um, in the rough, there can be, there's three distinct male types that are each kind of associated with different coloring and different ev 
different behavior. And this system evolved more than 4 million years ago. So it's fairly stable where uh, these different uh, types of males exist in this community, in this species. And that's, ha that's how it's been for um, as long as we've known. And so there's kind of these independent males which are on the right in the photograph which are a kind of dark color morph and they're thought to be aggressive. Um, there's these satellite males with the white plumage around the neck that are not aggressive. And then there's these fader males on the left, number three, where they have the same plumage as the females of the species and they tend to avoid violence and um, attention from other males or they avoid violent attention from other males. So the other males uh, don't particularly uh, kick them out of the, the mating grounds, whereas the more independent males of the black color would chase the satellite males from an area. Um, and when we speak about this where there are species that have the same uh, pelage between sexes in some of, so like some males of this uh, species has the same plumage as the female of the species. We really wanted to note that um, this is commonly called a sneaker male. Um, it, it's called other things in different species. So like in salmon, so they're called jacks, they're called faders and ruffs. But uh, if you're looking into this material, you will hear the term sneaker male. And we're, we're against that because it kind of suggests the idea that the male is hiding or, or is lying. Um, and especially in terms of people applying this concept to humans, there's often a, uh, an analogy drawn to trans women being really men and we wanted to kind of highlight that as scientists or people that are engaged in wildlife science, it's, it's important for us to kind of be aware of the effects that our words can have. And, um, you know, this is specifically in wildlife systems. We're not talking about human systems and using these concepts to legitimize transphobia is not uh, something that the science or any of this should support. And so um, we just really wanted to highlight that uh, we, we were looking for examples that did not use this term. Um, but if you are doing your own work, this is a term that you will run into. And we wanted to make sure that people were aware of it. So kind of in summary of all of this, we've kind of walked through uh, a brief understanding of uh, human sex determination. We've talked about chromosomes and how chromosomes arise. Uh, we've talked about different chromosomal systems in animals. Um, where does this kind of leave us in terms of our understanding of the natural world? And how do we take this understanding and kind of adopt an expansive under, uh, view of the world around us. So there's many things that can influence sex and how we determine sex really depends on the species and why we're determining sex. Um, we're determining sex because we're trying to understand uh, systems and populations that you know, cannot speak to us. We're under, trying to understand ecological systems or populations of wildlife so that we can conserve or utilize or uh, design management for them. And even across taxa, we can see the, that there's multiple uh, impacts of how we determine sex. So how we determine sex for different lizards will be highly dependent on the species because they have all of these different uh, systems of sex determination. And we don't really have a very firm grasp on everything 
that goes into determining sex. Uh, while researching this, this is one of my favorite quotes from one of the papers where uh, Stevant writes, sex differences have puzzled humanity since ancient times, not only within a scientific context, but also within a social context. What does seem surprising is the fact that despite the tremendous progress achieved, our understanding of the regulatory networks controlling sex determination is still incomplete. Nonetheless, it is clear that sex-specific cell fates are controlled by complex mechanisms of mutual antagonism and compensation. Overall, it has become clear that the cascade of events of governing sex determination is far more complex than originally anticipated. Hence, one must refrain from any rigid preconceptions and instead embrace new concepts and actual facts as they emerge. And most of the papers that I referenced throughout this talk were 2017 to 2021. And so this is really kind of the, the place where science is at with understanding sex. It's fairly incomplete um, and it's still an ongoing field of study. Um, I do just kind of want to reiterate that this is predominantly on wildlife systems. Um, and we approach this as wildlife ecologists, geneticists, and social scientists. Um, and this should not be used for uh, gatekeeping or saying that somebody is a specific sex or saying somebody is a specific gender. Um, and we hope that we haven't kind of done any uh, reinforcement of those ideas. Um, to understand intersex individuals and humans, we kind of uh, recommend a few resources. So uh, Intersection uh, is a um, documentary on the medical on medicalization of intersex identities and kind of the impacts it has on individuals. Um, and Jazz, maybe you could put the link in the chat if people are interested in reading more about that. Um, and there's currently advocacy efforts by the Intersex Justice Project demands where uh, they're asking for a public apology from the medical field for performing surgeries on the intersex people without consent. Um, they're calling to end intersex surgery uh, for cosmetic procedures, and they're asking for um, free medical care due to uh, the surgeries performed on them. Our hope with this talk is that we've kind of expanded the concept of sex. We hope that we've affirmed intersex and trans identities um, and tried to show that the scientific community on this is inclusive. Um, there's a lot of different mechanisms and different ways that sex is tried to be understood in science and it's not conclusive. Um, we also wanted to highlight that if you encounter arguments about biological sex, um, these arguments are generally not going to be made in good faith. Uh, I know I've personally engaged in a few Facebook conversations where the individual will delete the comment as soon as I start discussing biology with them. Um, so just know that uh, we hope that this shows kind of an increased acceptance, although it might not result in um, people changing opinions. Um, with that, there's kind of a final, any questions that people have um, that they're willing to be recorded? And if not, we can move on to kind of a non-recording uh, Q&A. Alita, could you uh, stop the recording and uh, 
Any questions? I think we're still recording, but we can. Uh... I think um, Alita put in the post that for some reason there something stopped. So they're probably trying to log in in order to easily stop the recording. Okay. Well, there's a question on what are my thoughts and views uh, of endocrine disruptor pollutants and their effects on wildlife? It's not an area I know very well, to be honest. Um, so I don't have very well-developed thoughts on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I know that there's several other uh, researchers in the, in the group um, or people that are participating. So if anybody that is more knowledgeable on uh, endocrine disruptor pollutants, um, please feel free to contribute. Um, Megan, I, I hope everybody can hear me. Sorry, my internet got out like just on the last slide, but I'm hopefully back now. Um, just to clarify, um, do you mean things like how, uh, you know, um, pesticides can disrupt uh, hormones or um, is, is, is that what you're specifically referring to? Um, things like how DDT affected like Eagles, I, I guess that's not endocrine. Um, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so there are, um, I mean, there are specifically, uh, I mean, not out of my own perspective, um, many impacts that things like pollutants can have on the environment. And there are many things in the environment um, that can, can influence specific sexes adversely, like we saw with the, with the eagles, right? Um, uh, where the females that were laying the eggs couldn't produce hard enough shells and things like that. Um, so yeah, it is, it's definitely a concern. Yeah, somebody else commented alligators in Lake uh, Apopka were feminized by pesticides. So I guess the, uh, there were more um, uh, uh, female um, alligators that were being born. So it would be similar to that population skew that Nathan mentioned during the talk. And I think recently, I think this is more of a genetic than necessarily endocrine disruptor, but um, I know that uh, genetic modifications to mosquitoes is kind of a common uh, disease control as well, where um, I, I think that they're trying to release a batch of genetically modified mosquitoes in Florida currently to try to control, um, I forget which disease, maybe Zika or malaria, but. Yeah, I know in Africa, at least as well, um, there's been these mass efforts where they would um, release a sterilized or sterile male mosquito, mosquito not sterilized, a sterile male mosquitoes. Um, and it would be thousands and thousands of mosquitoes that would be released. And, and that's definitely to fight um, malaria. So I'll switch to uh, stop the recording. Um, so that way, if, if folks have questions um, that they won't, don't want recorded, um, they can ask them.